Morning. Great, great. I think we're on. We're ready to go. Um, so appreciated the worship team this morning. Um, I think about Zephaniah and King Josiah a long time ago. Um, would have loved these songs because they really resonate with where they were going in life and where they wanted to take God's people. Um, so I really appreciated the worship time this morning. Um, it's been a long time since Linda and I have been here. I see there's some changes. Daniel, Daniel is on the worship team. Daniel, I look up to you. You know that. Uh, I think he's the tallest one up here. Um, but uh, it's really exciting. Daniel's grandmother is on, on the way here from Holland. And uh, we'll be joining the family soon. So that's exciting. So I wonder how your summer is going. Summer can hold lots of wonderful things. It can also have some hard things. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of that this morning. Um, but Linda and I are, are so pleased to be, be back with you. Um, so thankful that Pastor Jonathan extended an invitation for us to come and speak today. We want to be praying for him and for Michelle and their family as they're on vacation. That they will uh, be really rested during that time and come back really ready to hit the trail. Um, it's going to be a big fall here. And uh, we're excited about kid camp. That's coming up. That's big every year. And uh, then the fall is coming. We're in a, a series on the prophets. The book of the 12. How many minor prophets are there? There's 12 of them. And uh, this morning we're going to take a little time in one of them. Um, and it's called the book of Zephaniah. It's a kind of a hard to find book, so we'll tell you how to find that in just a moment. But you know, I just want to make a statement this morning. Um, God has the ultimate claim on my life. There's nobody else that has a claim on my life like God has. He's created me, and he's also the author of my next breath. He's going to enable me to have my next heartbeat. Um, and I really appreciate heartbeats these days. Um, yeah, thank you for your prayers, by the way. We'll give you an update at the end of the service. But we're just so thankful that God has extended to us life. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. He's always the giver of life. And you know, as you read through this book of Zephaniah, Oh, there are some stark warnings, a lot of woes in it. And you think, how could God treat his creation in the way that we read there? Well, it's only God who has the right to do whatever he pleases because he's the author of everything. And today we look to him and we want to somehow enter into his world. This morning when I got up, I oftentimes will read just a paragraph or two out of a book by A.W. Tozer. This morning it said this, a spiritual kingdom lies all around us, enclosing us, embracing us, all together within reach of our inner selves, waiting for us to recognize it. God himself is here awaiting our response to his presence. Let me read that again. God himself is here awaiting our response to his presence. This eternal world will all come alive to us the moment we begin to reckon upon its reality. This morning, God is here. And as he is here, he's waiting for our response to his presence. Father, as we open your word, as we look, as Josiah did so many years ago, into the word of God, what will we find? We want to meet you there. And we pray that you'll reveal to us yourself. We pray that we'll find the manifest presence of God to be so real in, in this morning's service. And we pray that our hearts will give you a proper response. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Well, the book of Zephaniah, we've entitled it this morning, Becoming a Bright Spot in a Dark World. Becoming a Bright Spot in a Dark World. We're going to look at the people in Zephaniah. We're going to look at the problem that we will face, and we'll look at the promise that closes off the book. Zephaniah. <laughs> wow. Zephaniah is a person, the first person we meet here. Zephaniah, if you're looking for it, go to the book of Matthew and then turn left and go four books and you'll find this little obscure book. It's only three chapters long. It's a little known prophet. It is not only hard to find, but he often gets ignored or confused with Zechariah. Once you do find them, you'll find that in the last 12 books of the Old Testament, which you've been studying, are the minor prophets. Zephaniah is number nine. Number nine. Zephaniah, his great-great-grandfather, was a man named King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, because of the royal blood, flowing down towards Zephaniah. Zephaniah could have been a king, but he was a prophet. He had a kingly heritage. And he was a prophet to Judah during the same time as, as Josiah, the young king who became king at eight years old, 640 to 609 BC. And some believe that Josiah instituted his reforms and brought in revival into the land because, much because, of the influence of Zephaniah. There's quite a bit of bad news in Zephaniah. It's three chapters. The first two and a half chapters are bad news. It's filled with woes and warnings. But then the last half a chapter, things turn wonderfully positive. We're going to end up on a very positive note, even though we're going to have some downers this morning for a little while. The day of the Lord, it's mentioned at least 19 times in the book of Zephaniah, speaking of justice and judgment to come. The day of the Lord was coming to the land of Judah, and it's also coming in our future. It's a double prophecy. We'll get into that in just a moment. But Zephaniah means the Lord hides. The Lord hides hides. And we'll, we're going to come back and talk about that, that significance. Zephaniah, it leads us right to Josiah the king. Josiah was a, just a young man when he became king. He was one of the godliest kings in Judah. Israel had lived through a civil war. They had split north and south, no, northern tribes of Israel and then the southern tribes of Judah. They had split through a civil war. And in the northern tribes, there was nothing of godliness. There were no godly kings, nothing to celebrate there. There were a couple in the southern kingdom of Judah, and Josiah was one of them. Josiah was a son of Ammon, who was a wicked king. He didn't last on the throne very long. He was assassinated, and suddenly at the age of eight, little Josiah stepped into a kingly role. That was pretty tough. But something good began to happen, I tell you. Leadership that follows God brings something good, something of life to the people. And that's what happened. So here's kind of a formula for running a kingdom. When you're eight, you take over. You know, who's going to tell little Josiah what to do? I mean, he was king. He could sleep in late. He could have sugar cereal in the morning, right, if he wanted it. He could have lots of donuts. Uh, I don't know that he did. Something happened in his life. By the time his life had doubled in age, he was in his eighth year of reigning, he began to seek God. So number one, if you want a formula for becoming a bright spot in a dark world, begin to seek God. Josiah did it when he was 16 years old. Four years later, he wiped out the idols in the land. We'll talk about them. They were such evil entities. 
but he began to clear out the idols of the land at 20. Then at 26, a very profound thing happened. He sent people to renovate the temple. The temple had been closed down. They hadn't been worshiping. They hadn't been offering sacrifices. And lo and behold, while the renovation was going on, somebody says, ah, look what I found. It's the book of the law. <laughs> it's the scriptures. Nobody had been reading the scriptures for years. The kings before him were so wicked, and they just turned the people away from God. Godly leadership in a nation is so important. As the leaders go, the nation follows. But Josiah says, I'm going to lead in a new direction. And he led the people into the scriptures. And so what you have here is, if you're at a point this morning where maybe God seems far away and you haven't been very close to him, be like Josiah, begin to seek him. <laughs> it's exciting. It's so exciting. You can repent. Repentance is mentioned in this book and it's a wonderful gift of God. It's when you're going down the road and suddenly you realize you're going in the wrong direction and you make a U-turn and you come back towards God. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a U-turn. And that's what we can do. If I've found that I've been drifting away from God, I can stop, I can turn around, and I can go back. That's repentance. I can begin to seek God. And I, I love, I love what the scripture says. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You can take that to the bank. The book of Jeremiah tells us this wonderful thing that God offers himself to us. Seek me, but when you seek me, don't do it half-heartedly. Do it with all your heart, and there's a guarantee you will find me. In fact, James kind of reiterates it in the New Testament when he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You can take that to the bank. Do you feel far away from God? Draw near. God will draw near to you. He will meet you every time every time if i have allowed something in my heart to rival god i can become like josiah and i can repent and i can take the idols out of the land of my heart is there anything that i deem more important than god is there anything that i allow to rival god's presence on the throne of my life I can evict it. I can send it packing. I can repent. I can turn back to God. And I can say, I'll be like Josiah. And if I have not regularly opened the word of God, if it's been a long time since I've opened this book and read it and taken it into my life, I can repent. And I can turn back to God and say, God, I'm so sorry but I'm going to make your word a priority in my life. And if you do this, something will happen. Something wonderful will happen in your life. You will suddenly begin to become a bright spot in a dark world. We have a dark world, but you are a bright spot. Or you have such potential to be a bright spot, like Josiah was. It's been a hard summer. Some of you, I know, through Pastor Jonathan, have faced loss. My heart just hurt when I listened to some of the loss that people have faced here. Um, just a month ago, we had loss as well. My mother passed away. We learned that she was going to be going into comfort care. My youngest daughter and I flew down and we were able to be with her for a few days before she passed. But you know, as I listened to people, as we prepared for the service for the funeral, and as we went through the funeral that Saturday, a month ago, um, it was just remarkable that people would come up and they would say, your mother was such a bright spot in my life. Um, she loved me. She gave me time and attention. People were talking about her in these tones. And I just thought, 
you know, suddenly I felt so proud of her because at 95, almost 96, she chose to still be a growing, changing person. She had some hard times in life. Life wasn't easy for her. And as she got older, she didn't appreciate the changes in the church oftentimes, and sometimes she would complain. But then as we talked it through, she would say, you know, I was wrong. She would admit when she was wrong, and she would say, I'm sorry. And then she would adopt a new attitude. And she was a refreshing, growing, changing person when she died. Her three last sentences were to the nurses, oh, you treat me so well. Thank you. She had just fallen out of bed, landed on a hard floor. She was in so much pain. And then she turned to my daughter and myself, and she says, oh, I love you so much. And then I bent down and I told her that some people were coming to visit her. And she says, and she smiled and she says, oh, I'm so happy. And those were her last words. And, you know, I just think about the fact that she became a bright spot in a dark world. We can do that as you draw near to God. He'll draw near to us. Um, we can choose to be like Josiah, and she did. So thankful for that. But, you know, as you think about it, there was a problem here. There's a problem in the land. Zephaniah and Josiah, they teamed up to address the problem and to bring about sweeping reform. They realized that the heart that we cultivate is important to God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for the one whom he will strongly support, whose heart is wholly his. Will you be that one? This is one of my favorite verses in scripture. It's a, it's a verse that I come back to so often. But the, it never changes. God is still looking. And right now he's looking through this congregation, looking for that one whose heart is wholly his. Will that be your heart? Will you be the one? You see, when you are the one, you can confront the problem. And the problem was a big one. There were actually two of them. There were two sins that were especially in focus here in the book of Zephaniah. One is idolatry and the other one is complacency. Idolatry came in the form of Baal worship. Baal, or Baal, was the god of the Canaanites. And the Israelites brought him in and began to worship him. He was a fertility god, a god of life and fertility to them. If they obeyed him, he would give them good crops, full wombs, and they would be blessed, they thought. But they weren't. It was a lie. It was a hoax, as all idols are. They promise big, but deliver little. But there was another one. It was Molech. That was the god of the Ammonites. And this is where it gets a little more serious. This god of the Ammonites required child sacrifice. And the Israelites were entering into that. It was despicable. God detested it. But they thought their lives would be better if they began sacrificing their children. Moloch required the sacrifice of children in a furnace set inside the belly of a bronze bull. These little children were burned to death. And the people watched. And they beat drums to cover up the screams of the children. I'm glad that we don't have child sacrifice today. It's nowhere around Canada or the U.S., right? Except for 63 million since 1973. I just wonder, all for a better life. It's a promise, but it's a bogus promise. It never delivers. And people are not better off by giving up their children. But you see, God loves life. Jesus says, I came that they might have life. But the evil one always comes to destroy life. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. If you see death and destruction, Satan is always the author of it. 
And when we give in to him, that will be the result. The problem was big in the land of Judah. For they go up to their roofs and they bow down to the sun and the moon and the stars. They claim to follow the Lord, but then they worship Molech too, Zephaniah 1.5. So they would worship God kind of in a token way, but then they would worship Molech and it didn't work. It never, never works. We've all built, we all have a built-in need to worship something or someone. We were made with a desire to connect and commune with the God who made us. And when we choose not to, then we begin to attach ourselves to lesser gods. Augustine said that you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they find rest in you, O Lord. God has made that God-shaped vacuum in us, that hole in our heart, and it's only meant for him. But we do try to fill it with other things. John says in 1 John 5, he says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Those are idols. There was idolatry in the land, but there was also complacency. In this next verse, we see, I will search with lanterns in Jerusalem's darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent in their sins. They think the Lord will do nothing to them, either good or bad. Zephaniah 1.12. They were complacent. They were indifferent. Their walk with God was not a priority. They, were, they just allowed themselves to become stagnant. Hmm. But sometimes God will send something to shake us up out of our complacency. The day of the Lord is mentioned 19 times, at least in the book of Zephaniah, more than any other time. A crisis was coming. The Babylonian army was going to besiege Jerusalem. And God sent Zephaniah 25 years before that would happen to warn the people. Distress was coming. The day of the Lord was coming. Often it takes a crisis to get our attention, to eliminate our complacency. I was just amazed. I was watching a football game last year. It was a Cincinnati Bengals that were playing uh, Buffalo. I think it was a, might have been a playoff game. And it was towards the end of the season. The stadium was full. People were really into the game. Suddenly, there was a safety from the Buffalo Bill team that was in on a tackle. He got up and started walking towards the huddle and he collapsed. His heart stopped. It literally stopped. His name was Damar Hamlin. And as it laid there on the field, the players, the referees, and all the fans in the stands and the announcers all went into shock. This isn't supposed to happen. What do we do now? And suddenly, there was such a deadly silence that filled the stadium. People gathered around this player on the ground. But they weren't standing, they were kneeling. People came out and they started to try to revive him and they couldn't. And he just laid there, he was unresponsive. And suddenly, people started praying. Suddenly, it was legal to pray again in public. Players, they were all like this, with their heads down. And most of them, I think, were praying. And suddenly, the unspeakable happened. One of the, I think it was an ESPN announcer, began praying. Well, you don't do that today. That's illegal, isn't it? But people cried out to God. And you know, suddenly, Damar Hamlin regained his heartbeat. They carried him off the field and they put him in intensive care for a while. You know that he's back in the on the practice squad again, getting ready for their first game. He's playing again. God answered people's prayers. There's been a lot of talk about that. But it took a crisis to get people people's attention and suddenly the complacency melted and uh, God was looked to 
And this is why Zephaniah came and he prophesied and he talked about the day of the Lord. He says, people, get ready. There's something coming. Don't be complacent. God made you. He gives you his next breath. He gives you his, your next heartbeat. Recognize his presence. Recognize his claim to your life. Nobody and nothing has any claim to your life but God. First and foremost, he's the only one that initially matters in our life. People matter, but God is always the primary one who I owe my life to. And so he has something to say about it. And he made me for a purpose. Do I know that purpose? Do I know that he loves me and he wants me to love him back? Now, it is just amazing. We're going to... Let, let, let me just... We're going to go to the promise here and we're going to begin to close the message. But, you know, there is the day of the Lord coming. It's not just spoken about in Zephaniah. But it is also spoken of by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. He tells us that judgment will surely come. And this is for us. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Knowing this day is coming... How do we prepare for it? Well, we look to the promise. There's a promise that has been made. And it's a wonderful promise. Zephaniah means the Lord hides. <laughs> what a wonderful name of a prophet, the Lord hides. Have you taken refuge in the Lord? What does that really mean? Let's talk about it, because I think you'll be so encouraged at the ending of this message. Zephaniah means the Lord hides. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you'll be sheltered or hidden on the day of the Lord's anger. In fact, Isaiah kind of reiterates it. He says... Seek the Lord while he may be found. And I say this with all seriousness right now. If God is tugging on your heart to make an advancement today in the kingdom, to yield your life, to surrender your life in a fuller way today, do not disregard that movement of the Spirit in your heart. Seek the Lord while he may be found. There are movements of God's Holy Spirit in our life. And there are times when we say, Ah, oh, I'm just too busy, or I have so much going on, or mm, I don't feel like it. But I'm going to remember that. I'm going to put this away, and, and I'm going to resurrect this at some point, and I'm going to really listen to God and respond to him. That day may not come again. That opportunity may not come again. You seek him while he may be found. Right now, if he's speaking to you, or tomorrow, if he's speaking to you, listen. Respond. Cultivate a responsive heart to him. He's seeking for that one heart who is wholly his. Say, God, my heart is yours. He deserves it, you know. He authored your life and mine. Hidden in Christ and kept from the wrath of God. You know what happens? <laughs> you move into the New Testament and there's the idea of being hidden in Christ there as well. In Colossians 3 verse 3. It says there that we are hidden with Christ in God. What are we hidden from? One of the main things is the wrath of God. Do we understand the theory of the wrath of God towards sin? God is a loving God. God is love. But God is also holy and righteous. And he has to condemn sin. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. He would be just some milquetoast deity who had no authority whatsoever. 
But God is God. Aren't you glad that God is God? And right now, the biggest need of your life and mine is to let God be God in our life. Um, oftentimes, they'll say, please accept me for the way I am. Well, God says, I'll do that. Will you accept me for the way I am? Will you accept God for who he is? And the minor prophets spell it out. God is a God of wrath. He's also a God of love. He's a perfect God. He doesn't let sin be swept under the rug. Every one of your sins has to be accounted for. Even the little ones. But this is where our heart just melts. Because it was on that cross that Jesus absorbed the wrath of God for every sin of my life. Every sin of my life was taken by him and he suffered for it. It was like an eternity of suffering in those moments on the cross. And he died having his father abandon him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God turned his eyes away from his son. Never in all eternity had that happened. They had the perfect union. You and I upset that union because of the love of God. And he says, I'll be the one. I will take your sin and a penalty and the wrath of God for it. I'll take it on the cross. And it was so excruciating. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you know, I see there's wonderful illustrations in life. I think we shared one about a prairie fire here once. But there was another one. Two men were out in a field and they saw a fire coming. And in the prairies, when the wind whips up those fires, they travel so quickly. They couldn't get away because it was traveling so fast. And one of them suddenly took some matches out of his pocket and he lit the grass in front of them, the dry, brittle grass. It just went, it ignited in the wind just kind of swept it and fanned the flames and it burned the whole section in front of them. As the fire was coming towards them, the other fire, they then stepped onto the place that was burned by the fire they had started. And when the other fire reached them, it stopped. Because where fire has burned, it will not burn again. Where the wrath of God has been poured out, it will not be poured out again. It was poured out on his son. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus for my sins. And if I take refuge in him, I'm safe. God is just. He's not going to exact that penalty from me when he has put it on his son. What a wonderful God. Redeemed people. They bring so much joy to God. By his son's sacrifice, we become the light of his heart. And he sings over us. You know that when a person comes to God, when they do that U-turn, repenting and comes back to God, trusting fully in his son. In Luke 15, it tells us of the sheep and the coin and the lost son. When they are all restored and brought back to the owner, there was great rejoicing. God was so thrilled with finding that son, the father was, and he was depicted as God. So when his son came home, he killed the fatted calf and they had a party. Can it be that he sings for joy over us when we take the gift of his son? Well, let's see what happens as we begin to close this morning. <laughs> you know, just maybe some of you have listened to the evil one and you believed his lies. You might think you are worthless and unredeemable. A miserable failure of a person. And God can never rejoice over you. The good news is Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ and what he's done, God can rejoice over me. He can love me. He can sing over me.
By Jesus, I'm forgiven, and the righteousness and loveliness of Christ is imputed to my account. And Jesus, as he was going to the cross, it says, for the joy, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. He was looking forward to this day when he could look into this worship service and see your heart and see that you've embraced Jesus Christ. That brings him ultimate joy. Ultimate joy. He created you for you to know him, to worship him, and to enjoy him forever. And when we come to him, it begins that whole process. Well, some of you are going to have a hard time believing that God delights in you. Because of your sins, you're filled with shame. I'm going to say something right here that I have a real hard time with. I almost wasn't going to read this, but I think I will. Max Lucado, he has a way of putting it. He captures this thought well. He says, God is for you. He's not against you. He is for you. Had he a calendar, your birthday would be circled. If he drove a car, your name would be on his bumper. If there's a tree in heaven, he's carved your name on the bark. Now, I personally have a really hard time with that. And I wrestle with those comments. Because I think it's not about me. Let's not make it about me. But yet, in a way, God does make it about you. And we have to realize that. Listen to this verse. The Lord your God is in the midst of you. A mighty one. A savior who saves. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in silent satisfaction. And in his love he will be silent. And make no mention of past sins. Or even recall them. He will exalt over you with singing. Now, either that's true or it's not. Maybe, maybe we should believe it. Remember when the prodigal son came home? He had all of his list of, Father, I'm going to do this, I'll be that, or... You know, I'm so sorry. And, and when the son came home, the father just embraced him. And he muffled all of his words as he just sucked him right into his, his breast. And he loved on his son. And he says, kill the fatted calf. Get a ring. Get, a, get sandals for his feet. Get a robe for him. My son has come home. He's dead, but now he's alive. And he just rejoiced because his son had come home. You don't have to impress God. You don't have to be anything special in the world. You just come and you'll delight his heart. Have you come? And I just want to ask you, have you come? Have you ever given your life unreservedly to Jesus Christ? Have you ever believed on him as your savior? Have you ever said, God, I'm a wreck. I'm a, I'm a nobody. I'm a sinner. But I need a savior. Will you be my savior? This morning, if you've never done that, don't leave without doing that. There is a day coming when the wrath of God will be poured out on sin. But you can be hidden. And you can be saved. And you can enjoy eternity with God. On the morning of my mother's funeral, I wrote to my brothers. And I said this. Life is so brief. And death is so imminent. But when he appeared, he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He abolished death. He turned death into a doorway for eternal life. A life with God forever. Unspeakable joy. Death became a doorway. I close with this. Thank you for praying. 
Um, I'm so grateful for your prayers. Um, in February, I stepped down from here. Um, I was just, my energy was gone. I couldn't handle two flights of stairs. I couldn't walk through the airport. And uh, in March, I ended up being taken by ambulance to the Mazankowski. And three cardiologists came in and they said, it's complicated. It's complicated. And I was there for a week. Um, I got a pacemaker. I feel like I have a new lease on life. It was an electrical problem. Thank you for your prayers. I say a lot to say this. While I was there, my roommate came in. He is 40 years old. He had almost died. But somebody, a cardiologist, did a surgery on him. He did a procedure that is rarely done in the whole world. And he saved this guy. The next day, the cardiologist that did that came to my room and started talking with me about my situation. And as we talked, our conversation went from the physical heart to the spiritual heart. I found out that he was a Christian. He was a lover of Jesus. And as we talked, the, the conversation became very, very precious. Before he left, we shared this verse together, and I leave it with you today. Hosea 6.3, you've probably already looked at Hosea, a minor prophet. But he says this, he says, let us know and become personally acquainted with him. Let us press on to know and understand fully the greatness of the Lord, to honor, heed, and deeply cherish him. I leave that with you and deeply cherish him. Will you do that? Will you make a decision today that for the rest of your life, you're going to deeply, deeply cherish him who would rather die than live without us, who took the wrath of God on himself out of love for us? The worship team is going to come. If you'd like to pray with somebody, there will be somebody to pray with up here this morning, I believe. And uh, if you don't come and pray, pray where you're at. But remember, God is here and he's waiting. He's watching and waiting for the response of our hearts to his presence this morning. Let's respond. Worship team.